Now I'd like to, re uh, pre pre to present our speaker, Roberto Fernandez III, the historian and re in residence at Historic Fort Lauderdale and adjunct lecturer at Florida International University, who will tell us, and his bio is on your chair, He'll tell us about Woodlawn Park Cemetery, the first black cemetery located in Fort Lauderdale. We've been there, and I have some pictures on a poster. I'll bring it in, and you can look at it. It's, abs it's historic. It's absolutely fantastic. Linda, how are you? Our city commissioner, Linda Anderson, is here. Yeah. 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 I appreciate it. All right, good afternoon, everyone. All right, so the bag that I'm holding and clutching actually has my service dog, Harley. So um, she's just chilling at my feet, so she might protest. I've been up since about six in the morning. I just came from Gainesville. I presented at a conference yesterday um, on Little River and a project that I'm working on with Broward College. I can, I can actually get closer to the microphone and that should help. Um, so anyways, I'm tired, the dog's tired, um, but I'm happy to be here. Um, what I tried to do, and I say try because you know the road to perdition is paved with good intentions. I tried to push out of just Woodlawn, although this will be a little bit of North Woodlawn Cemetery centric and Fort Lauderdale centric. Um, I did actually visit West Lawn Cemetery, and I tried to put in photos, but those got deleted. So I could talk to you a little bit without photographs about some of the, the things that I have observed at West Lawn in Dania. Um, I will talk a little bit about Pompano because I'm sure many of you are aware of what's going on in Pompano. And um, again, the major focus will be more central Broward, Fort Lauderdale, but it is an overview of kind of Broward County's black history. I'm sorry. How's this? Better. Better? Okay. So um, two of the things that I'm going to begin with are some quotes which you see on display. One is, history is everything that happens in the community. And that was coined by Dr. Cooper Kirk. I actually came across this quote in a Sun Sentinel article, um, I want to say from the mid 80s. And Dr. Kirk is considered the first uh, official Broward County historian. And he was also a social studies teacher at Piper High School. And so I always thought that that kind of encapsulates a lot of what I like. You know, we think about history in these broad national strokes and as, you know, uh, acolytes and advocates and historians of local history, we know that the local is really important to our work. Um, and then the other is, until the lion tells his side of the story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter which is an African proverb and kind of reminds us of making sure that we try to look for that other perspective that's often overlooked. And to some extent, I feel that the cemeteries allow us to look at some of these other perspectives, especially because with a lot of local history, especially the early writings um, in Broward County, the black story, the Latino story has been largely ignored. And so that's part of why I wanna make sure that I remind us of that. Um, as we kind of proceed with this uh, presentation, I do kind of want to set my norms and just let you know where I'm coming from as a presenter. Um, when we do get to the point where we have questions and stuff like that, I do encourage you to speak your truth as I will speak mine. Um, I ask that you stay engaged, which you're all here on Super Bowl Sunday, so I appreciate you being here and being engaged. Um, you know, please ex embrace discomfort. A lot of the things that I speak about will be hurtful and may be uncomfortable. Um, something that I've run into a lot in my work at the cemeteries is expect and accept non-closure. There might be questions that I just don't have the answer to. Um, and it's something that frustrates me and we will see that shortly with kind of some of the first photographs that I show you. Um, and then, of course, respect the space. We are all here. I am willing to listen and to learn from everyone in this room. And I hope that you guys will be open to um, hearing what I have to say as well. So before proceeding into the story of um, Broward County, I do want to go ahead and kind of harken back to uh, remind everyone that African American history did not start with the enslavement period. African-American history began with 
African civilizations on the continent of Africa thousands of years ago. And so part of the story um, that I want to just recognize is that you know, African Americans do descend from kingdoms and civilizations that had architectural monuments, had important history and art and culture. And so that's something that I want to make sure that's present on our mind as we move forward. Excuse me. Yes. Do we have the lights off? Is it this button back here? Try it. <laughs> that does not work. All right. There we go. All right, so. So many of you might be familiar with this photograph. Um, if you're not, then this is a photograph that was taken more than likely at the Stranahan camp where the Stranahan house is today. Um, we do not know the names of these three people that are pictured. Um, the only reference that I have to African Americans in Broward County during this period, and this is 1890s, 1900s, is a note that Frank Stranahan sent to one of his family members where he was commiserating about, yeah, there's nobody here and it's so lonely. And this is a verbatim quote from his document. It's just me and the quote, darky cook, end quote. So part of me wonders if one of these gentlemen could be that cook, but I don't know. Hence one of my non-closures. I don't know the names of these people and I would like to know who they are so we can say their name. Um, but this photograph reminds us that African Americans have contributed to the growth of Broward County even before the county was incorporated in 1915. Black men and women helped build the railroads and um, also would work on local waterways. So this is one of the photographs also of the first uh, canal that was being built in Fort Lauderdale, the North New River Canal. And as we can see in this photograph, we do have a lot of white workers, many of them possibly just in from Panama where they helped build the Panama Canal. And then we see off to the right of the photograph, a lone African-American man. This photograph always hits me because I'm like, even in a photograph, we see segregation. And you know, and it's possible that he did have another purpose, but why isn't he with the rest of the group? It just seems odd. All right, so one of the things that um, you'll see later, but it is, um, I had no other place to put this at the moment, but we do have um, evidence of the segregation that existed here in Broward County through many of the plats. Um, in Fort Lauderdale, there was a 1926 ordinance that basically separated the white community from the black community. Um, we have this plat that shows the colored section of Davy, and later on I will show you the overview of Liberia, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But from the beginning, we could see that city planners wanted to ensure that African Americans had a place to live, but one that was not too close to white areas. And I do remember an account from a former colleague who told me that she remembers as a child her mom taking home um, the maid at the end of the day into the, the colored section of Davy. So we did have people that interacted with a lot of the members of the community across both sides of the tracks. And speaking of the tracks, my first introduction to the other side of the tracks actually happened at Hollywood Historical Society. I was looking into the story of William Osment and uh, one of the volunteers at the Historical Society said, oh, who cares about that story? It's just from the other side of the tracks. As a Cuban American, it hit me pretty hard. And I was like, what the hell does it mean to be on the other side of the tracks? And I quickly came to learn what that meant. So, hard truth. All right, so like I said, my focus will be on North Woodlawn Cemetery and the work that I have done at Woodlawn. So North Woodlawn Cemetery is a historic black cemetery that started around 1918. This pushes my date pushes back what's uh, on the tablet, which generally says 1926. Um, and the reason I can date it to 1918 is because we know of the burial of Robert Bethel, and I'll talk about him later. 
but we do have a stone with that date and we have uh, historical accounts that tell us that he was buried at this cemetery during this time. So I basically came to this project because I was on the Broward County Historical Commission and during one of the Historic Preservation Month events, Woodlawn and Woodlawn Project through the Florida Department of Transportation and the Duras Homeowners Association were recognized and awarded for their work to protect the cemetery. And so I kind of came into it after that initial award. So I am on the shoulders of FDOT, but more importantly on the community and the Duras Homeowners Association. What ended up happening after that is we started at Boyd Anderson High School, what became known as the History Across Broward Initiative, which was a service learning project that was meant to connect students to local history. And it was also a way to engage the students in projects that involve presentation, historical research, and writing. So initially what we would do is we paired up with the Florida Public Archaeology Network and um, as you can see on the left-hand photo, that's uh, Dr. Michelle Williams. She was a former director of the uh, Southeast chapter of, the, of FPAN. And so she was out there teaching this, the children the CRYPT program, which is a big cemetery preservation program that FPAN offers. And it's very um, successful and helpful to people today. And so she, go ahead. It's off of uh, Sunrise Boulevard, south of Sunrise Boulevard, east of 95, and I want to say Northwest 9th Street. So it's in Fort Lauderdale. When you exit going east on Sunrise Boulevard, you are literally driving over a portion of the cemetery. So you're welcome. So um, Michelle basically allowed us to like, here's what you've got to do to document and to write down the, the names and the information. And so in the photograph, you see um, Evan and Khadijah kind of writing down information from one of the headstones at Woodlawn. And basically that's how we started. It was just a small project to write down the names. We did have concerns at the time that I-95 might be extended because they were talking about expanding the off-ramp eastbound on, uh, on 95. And so we're like, well, just in case they want to, we'll start by the gate and work our way in. And so that's what you see there is them kind of working on some of these markers. Um, what eventually happened is we started um, speaking with members of the community, so it turned into an oral history project as well. And so here we have um, Archie McKeithen, he was one of the owners of one of the black baseball teams up in Deerfield. And so he came and he spoke to us about growing up in Deerfield as a young man. And so he told us about some of the, the Negro League teams that he managed and that he saw. He told us a good story about um, Dr. Sistrunk making house calls up in Deerfield where he would basically catch the train, get off at the train station, do house calls all day, and then catch the train back to Fort Lauderdale at the end of the day. Um, and so oral history became one of the important components of the work that we did. In this photograph, we have the Bellamy family. And um, I have two photos of them, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch to the other one real quick. Um, and so with the Bellamy family, what they um, really provided us, and they've been probably one of the most enduring families with us, um, they started telling us about their family members. They went out to the cemetery several times with us. They showed the students where their loved ones were buried. Um, but what's special about the Bellamy family is that their father, Donnie Bellamy Sr., his marker at Woodlawn is a giant ficus. It's a native Florida ficus aurea. And so they're like, yep, this is our dad's tree. And so it's long been believed that or I say believed because I'm talking about the academic literature. It's long been known in the black community that some people do use trees as markers. Um, but with the Bellamy family, we have a name and a face and a tree that we can say, yes, this is a tree for this person. And we know this because the family told us. And so during the pandemic, um, I spoke to the family again through Zoom. And I said, why was the tree used as the marker? And the story that um, Miss Bellamy told me is that 
it, her mom went out there after Donnie died in 1947 and she said, I have to do this because it's a family tradition. And so the family tradition is something that, to me, the literature suggests it. I, I tend to believe the literature as well, where it is a residual of African traditions. It's a way of maintaining an African customer, African tradition, in spite of the enslavement and the over, you know, being overseen and overlooked and controlled by an enslaver. And so that is kind of one of those aspects of this story um, in that we have that tree. And then they also had one for Donnie Bellamy Jr., who was obviously the son of Donnie Bellamy, who died when he was about 12 years old through drowning in a railroad ditch. And his marker was a small cro uh, croton, I believe. I always say it wrong. Um, but it was a small croton plant as well. But when the cemetery management was changed, I want to say around 2014, 2015, they cut down that tree accidentally. But the ficus continues. Now, the cool thing about the ficus is that the ficus family is known in Africa. So people have knowledge of that species, of that family of tree and that species, um, actually the genus. Um, so they know what a ficus looks like. And in some tribes in Africa, they do use that, a ficus as that memorial tree. And the belief in some tribes is that as the tree grows or as the tree withers, it is an indicator of how the person is doing in the afterlife. So if you do go out to Woodlawn and you see this beautiful ficus tree that's larger than life, you know, kind of smile in the back of your mind and think, well, Donnie Bellamy's living it up in the afterlife, so. All right, um, there are many members of the military at Woodlawn Cemetery. And so I did, I made this map um, several years ago as a project for a GIS course that I took. I actually took the GIS course so I can make this map. Um, and so it allowed me to look at the different marker styles that are at Woodlawn. Um, it also allowed me to kind of identify how many veterans there are buried at Woodlawn. And we've identified about 90. And as recently as a month ago, I was out with Stranahan High School, and a student's like, hey, there looks like there's a stone under the, the roots of this tree. And so I was like, hmm. So I walked over, and I started actually digging, and I ended up uncovering another veteran marker that I hadn't identified before. So it was an exciting day for myself and then also for um, the students. One of the things that I would like to point out to you is this stone right here. This is the marker for Robert Bethel. I'm sorry. Does my cursor not show up? Okay, so the far right photo on the bottom. All right, um, you'll see that style again shortly. But um, that is the oldest pedestal style marker at Woodlawn Cemetery. So there are several of them. And um, we, we realized, I want to say in 2016, when I went with Plantation High School students, we actually started cleaning all the headstones. So we're like, wait a minute, there's a pattern. And now we can see it because they're clean. And so we figured out these are the oldest stones at Woodlawn. I've been to other black cemeteries throughout the state, Tallahassee and Orlando and Jacksonville, and I've seen a very similarly made stone in those other cemeteries as well, and including in Dania, although in Dania they've been painted, somebody took white paint and painted all over, over all of the old stones, but you can see it there, like the size, the shape, even the letters um, are there. So I think, and this is a hypothesis that I'm working on, that when George Benton, who was the black undertaker in Broward that came in the 20s, he was originally from Jacksonville, and he was trained to be a funeral director or a mortician up in Jacksonville, that that's where the main home of like the black uh, morticians in Florida in the early 20s. And so more than likely through train, tr you know, through the trains back and forth, the stones were made in Jacksonville and then sent by train to some of the other locations. So I'm trying to find, um, you know, I, I, I could find them. It's just a matter of trying to connect them all back to Jacksonville, and that's one of the ongoing projects that I have. Um, but we do have um, veterans from World War I, World War II, Korea. Um, we do have Vietnam veterans, and there is one 
um, I want to say Gulf War era, although he is, doesn't say like Gulf War or anything, but there is a, a Gulf War era veteran um, in there as well. He's the only Air Force veteran at the cemetery. But most of the other veterans are either Navy or Army. And their rank in um, the military does reveal segregation. And so the two stones that you're looking at, the one on the left that's gray that says William McCaskill, if you see the SC, that stands for ship's cook. And then, sorry? Yep. And so SC1, so ship's cook one, um, because as we know in the Navy uh, during World War I and World War II, African Americans were limited to only service roles on the ship. They weren't um, trusted with weapons, although the Army did have a couple of regiments that did serve in France during World War I and excelled and even received um, military honors from the French government. And then we also see the marker for Ulysses Griffin. And oh, that's it. $20 to the Historical Society. Yeah. I, was selling I was selling tickets. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know where she lives. I'm glad. <laughs> Um, so for Ulysses Griffin, he is a, a steward's mate, third class. So a steward, so these are the guys that kind of attended to the officers on the ship. So again, a service position um, during that time frame. One of the questions that I have and that I don't have an answer to is if you look at Ulysses Griffin, the, um, the symbol on his marker is a Star of David. I can't say definitive, definitively that he was Jewish. And there are several at Woodlawn where there are several markers where we have service members who have Stars of David. And so there's a hypothesis that the Star of David might actually be a other a symbol that represents something else, maybe connection to uh, the, the Mason um, fraternal organization, stuff like that. But again, I don't have the answer. And again, what, what looks like he's Jewish is not as easy to identify because when I requested his death certificate, he, he is listed as African American. So, you know, there, he could be Ethiopian Jewish, the Falasha from, you know, but again, it's just something, one of those. <laughs> there you go. So we, we, we don't know, but it's just an interesting to see it because they're, you know, I, I want to know. And again, just one of those, I don't, I can't find proof. All right. Um, and so here is the marker for James Weston. And the reason I have him is because he is one of the, one of two Buffalo soldiers. Now, mind you, hold on, don't get too excited now. There's a story here too. So most of us think about Buffalo soldiers. We should be thinking post-Civil War, um, the Plains expansion, um, Indian War, stuff like that. But the Army is really good about taking a really good history and keeping it and you know recycling it to inspire soldiers into esprit de corps and just give them like that unit camaraderie and here's your story and here's why your, your contribution matters. And so, yes, the Buffalo Soldiers started post-Civil War to fight against Native Americans. And they earned their name through battle with, uh, with Native Americans and because of the, um, the fierceness with which they fought and also because of the texture of their hair. The Native Americans said, oh, it's very much like the buffalo. So that's the belief of where that term or that word that was coined. So again, like the army likes it, they kept it, they wanted to keep continuing it, they kept it with segregated units. So the buffalo soldiers did serve with Teddy Roosevelt on San Juan Hill. The Buffalo Soldiers did serve as um, part of one of the divisions with General Pershing during World War I. And so James Weston is part of the 369th Infantry Division, also known as the Harlem Hellfighters. And so the Harlem Hellfighters has an interesting intersection because you have African Americans, but then you also have black Puerto Ricans that were assigned to that group as well. Interestingly, during, in 1918, the United States government granted Puerto Rican citizenship, and then a month after granting Puerto Rican citizenship, they 
granted them the, the privilege of being drafted into the military. Um, my great grandfather was one of those people that was part of that draft and called up to serve in the military during that time period. Um, but he was not in the Harlem Hellfighters because he was a white Puerto Rican, so he got sent to Panama. Um, and that's a whole other story for another day. But, um, and then, of course, during World War II, the 92nd and the 93rd Infantry Divisions um, both inherited the Buffalo Soldier Regiment uh, monikers, even though they were separate units, but they both said, like, we're the Buffalo Soldiers. No, we're the Buffalo Soldiers, but it was the 91st that actually had a buffalo on their patch. Um, and so we have, um, you know, two veterans that were Buffalo Soldiers in that legacy status, but it, it allows me the opportunity to tell the story. I just went through over 150 years of military history and, you know, one story, so. When it comes to medical care in Broward County, you know, there's uh, one person that usually comes up with for many people, and that's Dr. James Franklin Sistrunk. And the reason that I have um, both of these markers here is because this was one of the first attempts that we made to tell a story and to um, publish it. I connected with Bobby Henry of the West Side Gazette and he was more than enthusiastic to allow students to write articles and publish them in the newspaper. So it allowed us to you know, collect the stories, but then also share it with the community. And then it allowed us the opportunity to then go back around and um, you know, connect with new people and find new stories to tell. So um, if you look at the uh, pedestal marker at the very top, you might be able to discern that it says Sistrunk. When we first found the stone, it looked as you see it here, very dark, very hard to read, but you can clearly see cis trunk on the top. We got really excited. We were like, oh man, this is Dr. Cis trunk's grave. And we couldn't really read the text because it's so dark where you can't discern what's on there. And so immediately we we're like, okay, we've got this. What other clues do we have that Dr. Cis trunk is here? There's a large monument at Woodlawn that has the list of hundreds of people that are believed to be buried at Woodlawn. And Dr. Sistrunk and his wife Daisy are listed on that marker. So I was like, oh, we got the stone, we got this, he's buried here. I quickly found out that he was not buried at Woodlawn Cemetery. <laughs> Literally a week after it went into the West Side Gazette, um, we were at the Old Dillard Museum and James Bradley was like, nope, I always thought he was buried at sunset. And so I was like, oh my goodness, like this is not good. So I ran out to sunset. I took the photo that you see here and I was like, okay, how do we fix this? Because this is going to be a continued problem. So it becomes a methodological issue. How do we solve the problem of who is buried at the cemetery? And that's where I kind of came upon the idea of I'll request death certificates. And Florida is one of those states that allows anyone to have access to death certificates. You have certain limitations as to if it's older than 50 years, you get everything. If it's 50 years or less, then you don't get medical um, history. So if cause of death, that's not included. So I requested Dr. Sistrunk's um, death certificate and it had him listed at sunset as like the place of burial. Now, the question is, well, who's the Sistrunk? So I'm gonna go back and forth between slides now. So this is what the, the, the marker looked like before we cleaned it. This is what it looked like a week after we cleaned it. And so what you can see here is it says Daisy Sistrunk. And so if you go back, you've got this marker here for Daisy. Oh, sorry, wrong one. And then you can see on this modern marker that Daisy Sistrunk is also there. So here's the story. So Dr. Sistrunk and Daisy, Daisy one, um, <laughs> arrived in Fort Lauderdale in the early 1920s. Dr. Sistrunk came in early. I think he established, established the homestead and then eventually his wife Daisy joined him in Fort Lauderdale. She passed away. And so she was buried at Woodlawn Cemetery. Eventually, Dr. Sistrunk would remarry. So his second wife, is also Daisy Sistrunk. So I was like, oh, well, at least you can't, you won't say the wrong name by accident. <laughs> so, um, so Dr. Sistrunk, 
as many of us might know, is credited with delivering as many as 5,000 babies in Broward County. Now, I will, I, I, I will share this because it's been told to me, but I have yet to find documentary evidence, but I do trust the oral history. Dr. Sistrunk also delivered um, Puerto Rican babies, is what I've been told through the oral history, especially with the migrant workers that used to come in through Fort Lauderdale to um, pick, to harvest crops and stuff like that. The reason that Dr. Sistrunk ended up delivering babies for Puerto Rican women is because the white doctors wanted the whole prenatal care. And for many of the Puerto Rican women, they did not have the prenatal care. So it was Dr. Sistrunk who ended up um, delivering those babies as well. And it is believed that there are many Puerto Ricans that are buried at Woodlawn, yet I still don't have documentary evidence of that either, but I'm still looking. So, you know, Dr. Sistrunk would become the main name until the 1930s when Dr. Mizell um, came to town, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, there is another name, um, Dr. Sawyer from Miami. He ran the Christian Hospital, and some may argue that Dr. Sawyer was the first black doctor in Fort Lauderdale, because before Fort Lauderdale was part of Broward, it was part of Dade. Um, and so Dr. Sawyer, I think, deserves some credit, too, as being one of the, the black physicians. But Dr. Sistrunk is like, okay, he's ours. He made Fort Lauderdale home. He made Broward home. So, you know, we'll give him the credit. Intersections between um, Dr. Sawyer and Dr. Sistrunk actually presented themselves with this marker for Maggie Davis. Maggie Davis um, was born in Virginia around 1876. She was married to George Davis and was a housewife. On June 21st, 1923, she went to Miami Overtown for a surgical procedure at Christian Hospital. So Christian Hospital was dedicated in 1918 uh, and was funded with the assistance of a white woman, Miss Clarence Bush, who was unable to get her blackmate admitted into Jackson Memorial Hospital. So at the time, blacks in Miami were equally discriminated against and were not provided access to medical treatment. So. The, the woman donated the money to start Christian Hospital. So when Dr. Sistrunk came into Fort Lauderdale, this was the only black facility that he could treat his patients, especially for surgical procedures. Um, Dr. Sistrunk and later Dr. Mizell were both trained surgeons, and they were trained at Meharry Medical College in Tennessee. Um, but until the opening of Provident Hospital in the 30s, Christian Hospital was it. And so Maggie Davis ended up passing away after her procedure performed by Dr. Sistrunk at Christian Hospital. And so it's got him listed as the, uh, the attending physician and it shows the treatment um, that she had. So it, it's, it's interesting to look at stones and to look at death certificates because we can see the intersections of how black communities were connected through you know cemetery research and so that's why I, I like to tell Maggie's story a little bit. I wish I knew more about her, but I don't. All right, so um, Provident Hospital opened up in the 1930s and if you look on the second, um, the, the only guy that's got a, a lab coat and looks like a doctor in the front row, that's Dr. Mizell as a young man. Um, behind him is a young nurse, her name is Verdell Williams, and she is also buried at Woodlawn Cemetery. She's in an unmarked grave. Um, if you guys did the tour, I think I showed you like by the fence where it was just a grassy plot, and her daughter is the one that told me like, my mom is here. And Verdell was murdered by her husband. Um, more than likely, uh, this is something that I learned recently, more than likely, um, because of an allegation that she may have been having an affair with Dr. Mizell. Although I've got no other proof aside from a, an enraged husband, but here's where it gets interesting. The husband got away with murder because he was an ordained minister and was, had the title reverend. And so he um, dragged the body outside of the house, put it in the yard, and then called the police and said, my wife committed suicide. And of course, because he's a, an ordained minister, they believed him. So, all right, so that's Provident Hospital. And I just wanna show you another slide. 
of a different time period. So I show you this one because you can see what Provident Hospital looks like. This is closer to the 60s, right before it closed. But then at the same time in the other advertisement from the Fort Lauderdale Daily News, you can see the unequal access and treatment. You have three large hospital complexes in Broward County for the treatment of white citizens and you just have Provident Hospital for the entirety of the black community. And one of the things that I saw and I've read in the newspapers is that the city of Fort Lauderdale was very, um, at least in the documents, they were outraged that they were stuck footing the bill for Provident Hospital, especially because they had a lot of residents, black residents from outside of the city of Fort Lauderdale that were not paying their hospital bills and so the city of Fort Lauderdale was like, hey, can Hollywood contribute some money for Provident? And can Pompano contribute some money for Provident? And they're just like, we don't have to. So, um, but I just, I like pointing it out because Provident is mentioned in one of the small lines just in passing, but it's not as big of a deal in this advertisement. I just want to show that separate and unequal. Ma'am, you have a question? Yeah, so where was Provident and when? So Provident opened in, I want to say 1935, around there, and it closed in 1962. Where was it? It was on Cistrunk Boulevard, where the uh, YMCA is, the L.A. Lee YMCA. Right across the street from the YMCA, there's a park that's got a plaque that says across the street from here is where Provident Hospital was. And so when you go into L.A. Lee YMCA, there's a lot of like murals and, you know, hearkening to the Victory Theater and also to Provident. So it was there. Yes, ma'am. Also, where did Dr. Sistrom get his education? Meharry Medical College in Tennessee. And that's also where Dr. Mizell was educated. Yeah. All right. So a little bit about education. Um, as many may know, Schools in Broward County were segregated up until 1970 when the courts ordered um, desegregation. Although the school district did have um, small groups of students that were integrating the different schools in the county, but it was like small test cases, if you will. Um, but one of the things that I do want to point out to you is that um, this article where it says the new Dillard School on the Washington Park site would accommodate 1,200 Negro juniors and seniors um, for the, um, in the same manner as the Miami School for 350,000 is an all concrete fireproof structure. Um, so just to kind of show this is when they moved from what's the old Dillard Museum today. That was the original um, colored school for the county. So we do have accounts of students coming from Dania walking up the train tracks all the way up to Dillard, um, the old Dillard Museum for lack of a, and they would kind of go to school and then they would take the train tracks, walk all the way back to Dania. And we have accounts from Pompano as well um, until the schools were built for the students. And I believe I don't have direct evidence, but there's a story that Dr. Mizell might have been one of those kids that actually had to walk the train tracks to and from because there wasn't a high school when he was a child. Um, one of the students that would go on to integrate Stranahan High School is a gentleman named Samuel Hammond. He is buried on the westernmost portion of Woodlawn, close to I-95. Um, and so he was a football player at Stranahan. Um, he was very popular, according to some of the accounts that I've read. Um, I am trying to find his yearbook to see what might, might have snuck into the yearbook. And I'm also trying to access the school newspapers, because I'm like, it'd be cool to see what the, the students were saying at the time, because Stranahan does have some of that documentary evidence. But um, Sam Hammond um, attended Stranahan, graduated, and then he left to South Carolina State University. Um, where, you know, in that area of Orangeburg is where his family was originally from. And so he attended South Carolina State University, but in 1968, um, Orangeburg was a typical southern town still clinging to Jim Crow. And although it was home to two black colleges and a majority black population, um, economic and political power remained exclusively in the hands of whites. So uh, growing black resentment and white fear provided the kindling. The spark came when a black Vietnam War veteran was denied access to a nearby bowling alley. Um, 
one of the last segregated facilities in town. 300 protesters from South Carolina State University and Claflin University converged on the bowling alley in a nonviolent demonstration. A melee broke out with the police, during which the police beat two female students. The incensed students then smashed the windows of the white-owned business along the route back to campus. The governor of South Carolina sent the state police and the National Guard. By the late evening of February 8th, army tanks and over 100 heavily armed law enforcement officers had cordoned off the campus. 450 more had been stationed downtown. About 200 students milled around a bonfire on South Carolina State's campus. A fire truck with armed escort was sent um, without warning to basically put out the fire. And the story goes is that without any uh, provocation, a crackle of a shotgun rang out in the cold air. And um, the response was that the, the police and the National Guard basically shot into the campus to defend themselves. Um, when it was over, 28 students um, were on the state campuses with multiple um, gunshot wounds. Three others had been killed. Almost all were shot in the back or in the side. The three young men who were murdered was Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, who you see here, um, and Delano Mill Middleton, who was actually a high school student from Orangeburg. When was that? This was in 1968, February 1968. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because the family is still alive. Um, the elder sister, or actually his, his older sister just passed away recently. And his baby sister is now the matriarch of the family. And so she just came across, uh, she was just given all of like the suitcase with all the letters and all of his personal effects. Um, and she was telling me about some of the, the stuff that he was writing about. And one of the letters she said had um, him writing home and like, hey, I'm a starter with the, with the football team, which is unusual for a freshman in college, you know. So he was really excited about that and just, you know, talking as a college student would about here's what I'm doing and here's how it's going to help me, you know, as I get older and, you know, live my life. So, um, so going, continuing on with, um, with education in Broward. It was Wade George Allen who filed a lawsuit in January 1970 to desegregate. He attempted to enroll his students at Northside Elementary School, and the decision was finally um, rendered on April 30th, 1970, and it went into effect in June 1974. So summer school 1970 is when the school district originally integrated completely, um, and it, it was both um, students and staff and there was resistance by both students and staff to integrate um, both black and white um, students and staff um, the main method that was used to integrate the schools was through starbursting so basically they bust the kids from one zone to another to, to integrate the schools in that way yes ma'am So the, in, the, in the judge's ruling, he acknowledged that there were some schools, but then he even made a table of like, okay, so Stranahan High School is integrated, and yet there's eight black students at Stranahan. Plantation High School is the only, was the only all-white school in 1970, but most of the schools had less than 15 students, and they were claiming to be integrated. In the back? I know when Nova, uh, Nova School started back in the 1964-65, that was integrated, and I think that Donnie Mizell was one of the students there, because there were a few students that were African American in, in school. Gotcha. And that's what I'm saying, like that would have been one of the experimental, you know, efforts to integrate. All right, so looking into aspects of justice at Woodlawn. And so with this one, I will tell you that I'm gonna sit, speak some truth in this section. It might make some of us uncomfortable. I know it makes me uncomfortable to tell these stories, but I think they need to be told. Um, so one of the efforts that we did early on was to tell the story of Reuben Stacy. 
And so the reason that I mentioned Reuben Stacy is because he was an African American who was lynched July 19th, 1935. In this picture, and I'm gonna point her out to you because I can't point her out to any other way. The young lady right here is one of his descendants, one of his family members. So when I started the program at the school, what I told the students was, you know, I had them read an article from the Broward Legacy. And in the article, it was talking about the, um, the murder that happened of a grocer up in Pompano. And um, it side mentioned Reuben Stacy and his lynching. And so she took the article home because she was late to the meeting. So she took the article home to read it later. Her mom saw the article, read it. And the mother immediately was like, wait a minute, I think we're related to Reuben Stacy. And so then Chelsea read the article. And so the next morning she came into classroom and said, Mr. Fernandez, I'm Reuben Stacy's, you know, he was my great uncle. And so I remember like that, you know, hair on the back of the neck rising feeling. I was like, wow. And then it was like, okay, this is your story to tell. So you're gonna tell this story. I'm gonna give you everything that we have to tell this story. And so one of the things that you see in this photograph is that, you know, old looking book, that is actually the sheriff's index of arrests. And I'm gonna fast forward a minute. And that is the excerpt from the index. The second from the top um, is Reuben Stacy. The crime that he was alleged to have committed is assault to kill and his disposition is dead. His is the only um, name that I have seen where it actually lists him as dead. There are other people that I believe were lynched in Broward County, but their names ended up not going into the arrest index. That's a whole other story. Um, but this, you know, there's the historical record says that um, Reuben Stacy was went to the home of Marion Jones asking for water. She went to go get him a cup of water. He entered the home, attempted to assault her with a pen knife. Um, she defended herself. He then ran away. <coughs> the question never is like, why was he there? Why did he go to her house? The family has revealed that he was actually working on the Hill Farm or the Hill Grove. They had an orange grove. And so he was working. It's 1935, the Great Depression. So he actually didn't go to collect to get water. He went to go collect wages because he wasn't a drifter, as the accounts say. He actually lived in Fort Lauderdale. Um, there's a, a brewery called Orchestrated Minds Brewing in Fort Lauderdale. If you go just one block north of that brewery, that's where Reuben Stacy lived. That's where his family lived. So, um, you know, of course, there's this large manhunt for Reuben Stacy. The story goes that they brought as many as 50 different black men to the home of Marion Jones to identify him. The story goes that when Reuben Stacy was brought in, uh, Marion Jones' son said, Mama, Mama, that's the man that done hurt you, and he ran out of the house. Um, the accounts go on to say that he was immediately arrested, taken to the Broward County Courthouse, um, and that there was such a fervent desire in the community that the sheriff opted to remove him from Broward to take him to the Dade County Courthouse um, for protection from the mob. The story then goes is that as the police were leaving to go to Dade, which would have been through 441 as the most direct route to the Dade County Courthouse, that they were run off the road. And Reuben was taken and lynched outside of the home of Marion Jones. In 1987, an account from someone who claimed to have been at the lynching, she brought out that the person who perpetrated the crime was the deputy sheriff, Robert Clark. This is the brother um, of Walter Clark. And so the story that they shared in that article from 87 is that Robert Clark um, organized the lynching, and then for people who were witness, who witnessed the lynching, he took his service revolver and put the revolver into their hands and made them fire shots into his corpse as a way of making them an accessory to the crime after the fact. 
which answered one of my questions because I'm like, they lynched him, but then when I saw the death certificate said lynched by mob and then shot through heart with bullets. And so when I saw that, I was like, ah, oh, that's why. So a way of keeping the community quiet. Um, so how old, how old was he? he was 30, between 30 and 35. The age conflicts a little bit, but he had um, a son at home. He had his mother-in-law living with him. Um, and his niece, um, who passed away last year, like late last year, yeah. but she was recorded in the, the film Ruben. Um, but I'll talk about that shortly. So here's Chelsea um, photographing the book after uh, Denise Cunningham brought it out for her to review. And it was really exciting for all of us because like, wow, this, here's one of the documents and to be part of that. Um, in the photo, what you see is the students were actually presenting to the Historical Commission during one of the brown bag lunches their efforts um, at preserving Woodlawn and telling those stories. In 2019, the students um, from Plantation High School did a soil collection ceremony for the Equal Justice Initiative Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. And then um, you can see it kind of in the center a little bit. But that central jar says Reuben Stacy, and so it is on display at EJI. And then we do have the marker that has Reuben's name at the, um, the Center for Peace and Justice. So his name is said. Now, with regards to Reuben Stacy, in 2020, um, Ken Cutler is credited with starting the Community Remembrance Project. Uh, July 19th, 2020, Broward County. Uh, Mayor Dale Holness declares that uh, July 19th, 2020 as Reuben Stacy Day. It is the first time that anyone in the county accepted any responsibility or acknowledged the lynching of Reuben Stacy formally. Uh, June 15th, 2021, the city of Fort Lauderdale unanimously approved the secondary renaming of, the, of Davy Boulevard to Reuben Stacy Memorial Boulevard. And then within a couple of months of that um, renaming, multiple cities throughout the county sent resolutions in support of that decision. February 8th, 2022, the city of Fort Lauderdale unveils the street sign with Reuben Stacy Memorial Boulevard on it. And that's where um, Ann Navies, the child who lived with Reuben Stacy when he was lynched in 1935, came and actually shared a story about growing up with her uncle Reuben. And, um, you know, it was the first time because, like I said, Chelsea had never heard the stories. A lot of people hadn't heard the stories, but she finally felt comfortable enough to share the stories. All right, I'm going to fast forward. Um, many of you guys know that we had the wait-ins as one of the major efforts to integrate um, here in Fort Lauderdale, and that was led by Eula Johnson. Eula Johnson is pictured on the right in the white dress. Um, she was the second president of the NAACP Fort Lauderdale chapter, and I believe one of her nephews may have been one of the kids that also like waded into the beach that day. And so you have on the left-hand side one of the pictures of the students being removed, and this happened uh, July 4th, 1961. Um, and so this is important when teaching Florida history because it allows us to see, um, you know, to, to provide for the students something that is unique to Florida. We talk about the, the lunch counters, but we didn't have lunch counters, we had the beaches, you know, so that's an important um, aspect. All right, any questions about Woodlawn? Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, bike history? Yep. You There's, um, there's no marker at the moment. Um, I've, I've made attempts to have markers put into Woodlawn, but then I've encountered pushback from the cemetery board for the city of Fort Lauderdale because they want me to pay fees to have markers put into. And I'm like, I don't want to pay $500 to put something in that I, I didn't buy either. So that's a whole nother story, but. Ma'am? Is he buried underneath? I don't know. Like that would require um, an excavation. I don't know the details, but I believe it's probably somewhere, you know, around. Yeah, in the back. Is, it, is, uh, is the cemetery still exclusively black? 
So when it closed in, um, in the late 90s, it was principally a black cemetery, but there were white burials in that cemetery as well. Although I have yet to find a white um, person that's buried in the cemetery. The Puerto Ricans, were, many were buried there. Correct. The, the Puerto Ricans would have been white or black. It just depends. Like I'm Puerto Rican as well, and I'm a white Puerto Rican, so okay. you know, it just. Why did it close? It closed because uh, the records were not well maintained. So when the city took it over, they're like, we don't know where we can bury people, and so that became the real reason. And there are stories that there may be bodies that are double stacked at Woodlawn as well. So how many people are? How many burials are in there? So. It's believed that there may be anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 people wow. in that 4.1 acre cemetery. So it's still there, but it's closed? It's there as a historic cemetery for people to visit. I take students on tours, just like I took y'all on tours to use it as a community resource. But people still visit their loved ones. Commissioner? Isn't one of the reasons that it was closed is because it wasn't maintained. Nobody would take the charge to take care of Correct. Thank you for sharing that. that. And it is because the articles during that time period talk about, oh, there's drug deals that happen there and there's trash and there are, you know, there's some ignorance in understanding the uniqueness of black cemeteries is one of the issues that we see, which is why it's like, oh, it's trash. Well, there's not trash. You know, you have to be careful with grave goods. So that's one thing. But yeah, the, for the city, it was a bigger, there's crime and it's poorly maintained. And so that was one of the things that led to, I believe, the taking of the, the property because there weren't uh, taxes being paid on it. So is that correct, Commissioner? Yes. Yes, thank you. Are there any other all black cemeteries in Broward Actually, there are. Yes, how many? <laughs> how many? So we have Westview Cemetery in Pompano. And so here's a quick view of Westview Cemetery. Um, so I, this is in Pompano. Yep. Correct. And so this is the final resting place for Esther Roll. So um, that's the, the kind of far view picture of Esther Roll's grave. But then her father is the photo on the right. And the reason I, I point both of them out is because they do remind us of the Bahamian connections and the Bahamian pioneers that settled in South Florida and built the community. Yes, in the back. When we go back to Woodland, when our historical society had a tour a year or so ago, I believe Clyde, um, Clyde who was our president, uh, had mentioned that his father had worked when they were building 95. Correct. And that they had unfortunately <clears throat> gone over some of the graves and just sort of desecrated part of the cemetery. Do you know if that's... So, so we did interview Clive Taylor Sr., so Clive's father. We did interview Emmanuel George and I interviewed him, I want to say about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And so that is one of the things that he confirmed as he goes, I heard it on the, um, on the, 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 the radio that it came on when they found bodies on the right of way. Right, exactly. And, and so, you know, so let me f go back a second. Thank you for the question. In 2015, one of the things that FDOT did was they actually uh, hired an uh, archaeology firm to do ground penetrating radar of 10 feet of woodlawn from the fence in on the westernmost portion, which FDOT owned 10 feet into the cemetery at that time and the grassy area on the shoulder of I-95. So they actually had FHP block off the lane so the archeologists can work safely. Um, the ground, ground penetrating radar at the time did find disturbances that indicated potential burials on the shoulder. Of course, the community, um, the community group for FDOT was like, if you find any remains, leave them in place. That was the desire of the, the community and with many descendants of the community. In, in the conversations with the archeologists thereafter, they said, we, we, 
we find the the disturbances in the soil, but then at the same time, there's a lot of fill dirt. So basically like just dirt that's piled on top of it. And it's like, well, how is there fill dirt if we know that we, we buried our loved ones there? That's where Clive's story comes in because what Clive said was that he heard the announcement on the radio, on the, the state car, and he was working on, on I-95. He was not directly involved with any of the, the work in that capacity because he was more South Broward, but he did hear it because he was a supervisor. What Clive did share is that whatever happened, happened fast enough where the, um, the contractor was unable to charge the state for delay of project. So between that narrative of they were unable to charge for a delay of project, because if, if the burials would have been removed, that would have led to a delay of project. With the archaeologists finding fill dirt, my hypothesis is that the state got fill dirt, dumped a bunch of dirt on top of the bodies, and continued to build the interstate. That was the solution. During the pandemic in April 2020, um, there was work being done on one of the lights on the shoulder of I-95 by the cemetery, and an archaeologist contacted me and said, hey, I found a human remain. And I said, where? And when he said it was outside by a light pole, I said, I'm not surprised. The oral history and the archaeology confirms that that's a possibility. And so those remains, it took about a year for that remain to end up being reinterred at Woodlawn. And that remain was um, buried. And then that's when they put up the other marker at Woodlawn that talks about the burials on I-95. So that is, you know, so Clive actually did allow us to figure out that missing piece during that tour. So other questions? Yes, ma'am. No, I just wanted to say going back to Ruben Stacy, um, Chelsea was here about two years ago. <clears throat> we did a presentation for Black History Month, and she was she came to the meeting, as did Ann. And exactly. Oh, cool! So you had Ann Navies here too. We had, yeah. Okay. She, passed, she, she did. She passed last year. She was such a beautiful woman. Yep. It was unbelievable. So back to the question about Black cemeteries in Broward. Unfortunately, the pictures that I put for West Lawn, which is probably the most relevant to everybody here. Um, they didn't come through, but I did find the markers for Isidore and um, Minnie Mizell, Dr. Mizell's parents. Um, Leola Collins and her husband are also buried at West Lawn Cemetery. And there's, um, there's even a, a player who played for the Dania, I believe it's the Dania Redbirds, um, that's buried at West Lawn as well. Like it's a really nice, on the big mausoleum, if you walk towards it, on the the larger front-facing side, you see his um, his marker with that connection to baseball. You're talking about the one that's on this between Ely, it's on Ely Yes. Between and Correct. Liberia. Yes. That's the cemetery. So years, years ago, uh, it was said that West Lawn was in Liberia, and because of Something with Hollywood and Dania. Dania took over West Lawn, so it's no longer in Liberia. Gotcha. So I guess I got to play with this map now. So, but um, you know, so it, this is from the what's it called? Oh my gosh, so yeah, so we have the northwest corner, which is Liberia, the segregated community that would be, would house the black residents of the city of Hollywood, but in, in the, this was the Hollywood Reporter, I think was the name of this, um, it even says like we need a nice area for our black residents to live because we need them to work in the city of Hollywood, so, all right. This, the top section near the Compass Rose, that is what was planned to be Liberia. And so it has the, a, a circle for a park, and then it also, they also plan to have like a, a nice hotel. So they, they planned on something, you know, 
something nice, but the nice never happened, at least, you know, the reality of it. But he did plan on having that. That's so, like, what is like? <clears throat> so this is Dixie Highway. So if we talk about the cemetery, the cemetery might actually be in that square between. OK, you know it's two cemeteries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. There's the, the white cemetery on the other side. Because at some point, it's believed that the white, the white cemetery housed some of the black residents as well. Now. Now. Then, originally. In the, in the 50s? In, before the 50s and the 20s. And what they ended up doing was they, they exhumed all the bodies and they, they took them over and buried them at, um, in the black cemetery and they just dumped all the headstones and everything on the ground. And there's even allegations that the, the, the convicts that were actually exhuming the bodies were taking jewelry from the remains. <clears throat> so there's a marker on the property. Um, so that is something that um, I will, I, I'm personally trying to work on for you as the Hollywood Historical Society is to actually be able to do a tour of um, of, the, of the cemetery in Dania. Um, Brynhilda Knowles Memorial Park and Cemetery is one up in Deerfield that was an almost erased cemetery. And it was a community advocacy and archeology span you know, in 2015 timeframe that really led to that becoming the park, the memorial cemetery that it is today. But there's no more headstones, it's just there's a, a nice public art piece that has the names of some of the people buried there. Um, and then by Dillard High School, there was Washington Memorial Cemetery, and that one was erased in the 60s. So we do have um, evidence from the newspapers that show that Bazalone, who was the developer that bought the property, did try to contact the family, and after about a year, he was able to exhume the bodies and move them to Sunset Memorial Cemetery in Fort Lauderdale. And so now there's a, a 7-Eleven gas station and a dollar, dollar General where a cemetery used to be. Where is Sunset now? Sunset is off of uh, 31st, 27th. So, all right. All right, so just, you know, conclusions that I hope you take away from this is that African-American cemeteries are historically significant. Oral history is an important method in learning some of the stories of the cemeteries. Um, historical and geneal genealogical records are key to helping tell some of these stories. Um, and unfortunately, they are poorly maintained and deteriorating. So, you know, we have to do more yeah, to protect them. In some cases they have, in other cases they can't. And so that's kind of what we're seeing now with the cemetery in Pompano is where it's privately owned. And so, and in some cases the cities don't want to take them over. So, all right. So thank you all so very much.